to start off the card, we got Jai Herbert versus Ilya Taporia. You know, we had the local boy in uh, Jai Herbert versus Ilya. Ilya is a guy who, what, he's undefeated? Something, something along those lines. A guy I feel like is undefeated, right? Number 15 ranked in the lightweight division. Now, it's going to be interesting because today is Tuesday where we are releasing this episode. Same day. But UFC also goes into the war room. Dana and the people go into the war room on Tuesdays and they get the, and they update the rankings. They get the new fights done. They look at all that stuff. So, I think today's a perfect day. So, Ilya Taporia... I'm trying to pull up his record, El Matador. I'm a big fan of Ilya Tapori. He's a guy who's from Spain. I was born in Spain, raised in America, lived in America my whole life. But again, been to Spain many times. And again, I was born in Spain. I'm a big fan of the guy. I wish he was full fucking Spaniard. I hate how he's like half Georgian because it's like, damn, I don't have anyone except for like Juan Archuleta and Bellator. But he's not in the UFC. Which is fine. I love Bellator. Love every promotion. And that's the beauty of this channel. Stick around because we're going to cover everything, man. 1FC, Eagle FC, Bellator, UFC, Ryzen, whatever. We're going to cover everything. If it's big, we're covering it. UFC or not UFC. So, Ilya Toporia, El Matador. And I say that because I have a Spanish accent. You know, I could, I could flex like that. Yes, he is 12 and 0. That's what I was trying to uh, get to. Uh, you know, I segued. Wade. I always fucking segue. My apologies for that. If you've stuck with us through the nine episodes and now number 10, that you know that I segue a lot, but it's interesting segues nonetheless. So there's there's pros and cons to it. Here's what I got out of Ilya Tapori in this fight. I got a few things, you know, a couple things out of him and a couple things out of the overall arc of the fight. What I got from Ilya Tapori is this. It's a guy that when he's hurt, he's smart enough to know what he has to do to get himself out of that danger point. So, again, he's a guy who was stunned. He was rocked. He got caught with a head kick real bad, real bad. Beautiful head kick from his opponent. And it was, he was pretty much, he wasn't dead to rights, but the guy was on wobbly feet. He was on shaky feet. He did the right thing. He did something that a fighter should do when they're hurt. He put himself out of a danger, out of a position of danger. Whether that's, whatever you have to do to get yourself out of that position where it gives you time to recover. It doesn't necessarily have to be what he did. You don't have to engage in wrestling exchanges. Whether it's you start circling the octagon, whether it's you actually do end up taking him down, whether it's you start clinching him like he did or go for that takedown attempt, as long as you give yourself time to recover, it's always a good thing. So what Ilya did in that fight, it showed me that if he's a guy that gets hurt against a guy who, you know, you got to believe you can start fighting a lot of tougher guys with more power, more experience, more talent, more technique, more skill. He knows what to do if he's going to get stunned. And when you start facing better guys, the op the odds of getting hurt in a fight are going to go up a lot more, right? Because they're guys that can hurt you, right? Because they're better opponents. So Ilya showed me that he's a guy that he can take a shot, number one. And number two, again, to reiterate, he knows what to do to get himself out of that position of danger, to recover, to give himself time. And he did it beautifully. You know, he ended up getting going for the legs. It took him a 30, so, 30 seconds or so there to actually take him down, but did a... I ended up going, actually body slamming him in a beautiful manner, getting the takedown, getting him on the ground and doing what he does. The guy's a stud, man, okay? Um, but here's my issue with Ilya Taporia. You're not fighting ranked guys yet, okay? Listen, full transparency, I'm a diehard MMA fan. I did not know who Jai Herbert was. I didn't. It was good that they got him on the card, a guy give him some exposure. He showed some skill in that fight, whether he won or lost. You know, he showed that he's he's got some good kickboxing. But I didn't know who the guy was, you know, fairly unknown guy. And I'm a diehard fan of the sport. So you're getting rocked by a guy like that. And it's something that, and again, you guys could say, oh, you know, you know, you don't know who that is, whatever the case may be. You're not a diehard fan. I get it. You know, I'm, I should probably know who Jai Herbert is. The thing is, if you're getting rocked by a guy like Jai Herbert, what's going to happen when you fight the Justin Gages of the world? What's going to happen when you fight the, Edson, the um, Conor McGregor's of the world? What's going to happen when you fight the Dustin Poirier's of the world, the Islam Makachev's of the world, even the Bobby Green's of the world, who is a far better kickboxer than Jai Herbert? What's going to happen? Are you going to be able to recover? Because those guys are smarter at putting their opponents away. Just like you're smart at knowing what to do to recover when you're hurt, those guys are far smarter than a Jai Herbert in knowing how to put you away when they have you hurt. And that's something that Jai Herbert didn't necessarily do well in this fight. But he didn't necessarily do it wrong either. He just didn't finish the fight. You know, you did a good job. But it makes me wonder, again, a couple outcomes I took from him. The guy could take a shot. And number two, the guy's smart enough to have the wherewithal of what to do when he's hurt. But my overall take of the fight is what's going to happen when you get rocked by a guy 
of more talent. And I'm not talking about Patty Pimlet because I think him and Patty are in the same boat. And that's something we're going to talk about in a couple fights. Uh, you know, it's, I think it was a third fight. So we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But it makes you wonder, you know. And again, I was born in Spain, man. I'm a fucking Alia fan. Forget about Georgia. It's all good. He's he's 100% Spaniard as far as I, I'm concerned. I don't even... I don't even bring the Georgia thing into the equation. No disrespect to Georgia, you know? Equality, all that stuff. You know, I'm all for it. But Georgia, man, I mean, you're from Spain, bro. You know, like, that's the Spaniard flags on the left. Like, when he shows his flag, the Spaniard flags on the left, right? With the exception of, like, fucking Asia. Don't they go from left to right in every country? So Spain's first. Fuck it, Spain's first. It doesn't matter. Molly McCann versus Luana Carolina. Again, guys, I go into these soliloquy sometimes and it's too much but they're interesting soliloquy so don't worry molly mccann versus luana carolina uh, you know if anything that fight exposed something in dana white's eyes dana white might have been in the stands and you know molly mccann lands this incredible again knockout not again but knockout of the year candidate for a f- you know, in the, in a flying elbow where she just fucking lands it flush on her chin, puts her out. And again, Patty Pimlet said this in the post fight interview, and I got to agree with one hundred percent. I mean, how many females are you seeing doing that, except with the exception of like a Valentina Shevchenko? And I granted, I know she did it like one, you know, like one fucking time here. But how many females are you seeing, with the exception of like a Valentina Shevchenko, Amanda in her prime? Not even Amanda in her prime, because I would have to go back and check that. How many females are you seeing just put? put girls flush out like that. And I'm not talking about multiple times. I'm just once. I'm saying just once. Because similar to the men's flyways, I love watching female fights, but I'm not expecting a, an epic KO, KO in these fights. I'm not expecting a girl to have her lights put out. Again, with the exception of a Valentina Shevchenko, of girls like that, of even a Rose Namajunas, who's an absolute stud in a lighter weight class, even for females, which is a... Massive credit to her power, to her technique. Because a lot of Rose's stuff doesn't just come from her power, right? It comes from her ability to set it up with, you know, great coaching from Trevor Whitman, a great mind in her, her husband, Pat Berry. But again, that's beside the point. Who's doing it like that, really? Besides a couple of women that we just named, who's doing it like that? Who's really, which female fighters are putting girls flush out like that and, and having epic KO knockout real highlights like that? Molly McCann just fucking did it, man. And, I, and again, which is, what, which is what I was going to say before I went on another fucking soliloquy, as I always do. My apologies. Dana White was probably in the crowd thinking after that fight, like, holy shit, we got a star, you know? Anytime I have a card in England, forget about London. Anytime I got a card in England, you know, she's going on it. Because she, she got a fucking big pop from the crowd. She finished in style. She knew that... She felt like she was in a place where a lot of family was watching, a lot of friends. She was in a, a home territory, a comforting territory, a territory where she felt more motivated to perform. She fucking went out and knocked the girl out with a fucking spinning elbow, KO, flatline, knockout of the year contender. Like she said, I got to do something like this, and she did it, guys. It's not easy to do. You know, give her fucking credit. Um, in the first round... Molly McCann finished her, you know, hurt her several times. And again, I had that parlay where Luana fucked me over, which is all good, Luana. You know, we're good. You know, just redeem me in the future with parlays, but we're cool. But Luana was hurt several times in the first round. You know, Molly hit her bad, man. She was she was hurt. And what happened? Lu- uh, you know, Ma- Luana was able to overcome, and she had a very good second round. I don't think she won it because I thought Molly had more of the threatening shots, threatening activity in that second round. But again, Luana did outstrike her overall in the second round. And, and, you know, things were going good. She had her in a couple submission attempts. And then the third round, Molly just puts her to sleep, man, and then puts that fucking whole thing to rest. So, good fight. Molly McCann, congratulations. Is she going to get a ranked opponent next? Because she ain't ranked, is she? Unless I'm just mistaken. Molly Meatball McCann. I don't know. She's not ranked. Nope. Let's get her a ranked fight, UFC. Let's get her a ranked fight, Dana. Boss man, Dana. Third fight on the card. And again, some fucking oddly similar things to the Ilya Taporia fight. And the reason I say oddly is because, you know, they got this whole storyline. They're connected now. We saw the whole thing that happened in the hotel. Patty Pimler versus Kazula Vargas. Okay. I feel like I overstated that a little bit. Let me just sort of 
backtrack like you know you know like when you play forza horizon and like you fuck up on like a big turn in a, in a race that you're winning you get to rewind like 10 seconds it's perfect if only you could do that in life patty pimblet versus kazula vargas i did say it's similar i did say oddly similar again i kind of want to backtrack just a little bit not a lot just a little bit because listen patty did get hurt a little bit patty but he wasn't nearly as hurt. Patty got a little bit stung, but was Patty like wobbled? Was he like fucking out of it? No, not not even like twenty percent of what Ilya Taporia was when he got hit with that head kick. But again, Patty got hit with a big shot, and this guy was able to take Patty down to the ground. Whether Patty got hurt from the shot and that aided in Kazula taking Patty down, whatever the case may be, Patty got taken down. Patty was in a vulnerable. Patty was in a vulnerable position where he had a guy in top mount on him, okay? Listen, say what you want, but when I'm watching guys like world beaters in their prime, like Jones, McGregor, these guys that Patty's being compared to in terms of hype, Hamza, these guys aren't being put in compromising situations where they're being hit with a, with a huge shot that drops you like you did in your first fight, where they're being put in top mount and taken down like you did in your second fight. That ain't happening to a Connor. That ain't happening to a Jones, Hamza. Guys that have similar level of hype to you. So I'm putting you on that scale. Because that's where people are comparing you to. So that's what I got to do, Patty. And that's why I say maybe it wasn't similar too much to the Ilya fight in terms of, oh, wow, they both got, it was oddly similar. Like I said, that they both got knocked down or hit hard. Because I don't think Patty was near, hit nearly as hard. But again, at the scope that we, you know, in the scope that we view Patty of, the lens we view Patty at, that's not good for Patty. You know, Patty got hurt bad. Again, let's reiterate to the Ilya Taporia fight. If you got a guy like, if that happened to you against Islam Makachev and you got downed in that fight, you ain't getting back up, Patty. Ask Bobby Green. Ask Dan Hooker. Ask fucking a thousand other guys that I cannot think of. of the, Drew Dober. There you go. Ask many other guys that have faced Islam Makachev. There's certain matchups in the lightweight division where one, if they catch you with a shot like that, they might finish you. Two, if they get you in top mount like that, you ain't getting back up to your feet. Charles Oliveira, Islam Makachev. Islam ain't the only one, bro. Benil Dariush. Benny's got some good jujitsu. So again, man, what's going to happen when you face those top level talent? And that's where I reiterate for like the 15th fucking time. Oddly similar to the Ilya fight where they got this beef, but there's certain things that I'm seeing in them. There's certain questions that I have about them. There's certain things that I am seeing in both of their fucking fights that are similar in the sense of much like Ilya, yeah, you're good. Yeah, people are starting to like you. But if you get in, you get put in a disadvantage like that against the guy that's ranked, against the guy like, even against the guy, even against the Diego Ferreras of the world, even against the guy, you know, got 14 13 14 15 12 ranked in lightweight division they're not gonna they're gonna be more efficient in their ability to take you down and finish the fight or their ability to finish you on the feet when they've got you hurt you know what i'm saying so again patty's got to be careful there now those were sort of my cons to the patty pimble fight here are the pros patty pimble's a dude he's a bad motherfucker you know he's someone that similar to like an arnold allen he can thrive anywhere in the fight but not to the level of an Arnold Allen because we see Arnold Allen, you know, doing what he does in the stand-up. But Paddy Pimblett, no matter where the fight goes, I think he has a chance anywhere. You know, I think he's got good hands even though I think he's, he's, I think he could have had a better representation of, of himself in the boxing department in the UFC. Um, in the ground, you know what he's done. You know, he's done incredible since then. But again, man, Paddy is someone that, given the flaws, given what I just said, he did submit the guy in the first round. You know, it took him less than four minutes to submit Vargas, a, a tough guy. A guy who wanted to rip his head off. That's what it looked like right from the start. And he's someone that he sort of, it looks like he knows how to turn on the switch when he has to. You know, we saw he was all, you know, you know, giddy up, giddy up, this, that, and the other. You know, everything's going great. I'm in London. I love, you know, my friend. Oh, there he is. There's my family. But when he saw Vargas staring him down like a fucking pit bull, guess what Patty did? He brought that same energy back. He stared him down and locked eyes with him. And from there on out, you know, dead set on uh, Kazula Vargas all the way to the finish. So we got to give Patty Bimlet the credit that he deserves. Again, 
They asked him, do you want to rank the opponent next? He said, add two zeros to my fucking paycheck and I'll take a ranked opponent. And it's almost the exact same approach as Sean O'Malley. Like, why should I fight these guys that, maybe not that I'm ready for, but that the, the percentages of me getting defeated and ending this whole hype train are over if I lose to this guy. Put a couple zeros on my paycheck, then we'll talk. I think he's going about it the right way. You know, is, is Dave Portnoy advising this motherfucker? You know, we know Dave's... Is, I'm joking, but we know Dave Portnoy is a smart dude, you know, smart guy in terms of making money, you know, putting out a name for himself, his brand. So maybe, you know, Patty, Patty took some notes from Dave Portnoy in the Barstool headquarters. We got to get Patty on a pizza review. Like, does anybody else love those pizza reviews of Dave Portnoy? We got to get Patty on one of those things, man. So we got the co-main event, Arnold Allen versus Dan Hooker. Here's the thing about mixed martial arts. You got two guys that you love. Um, you got two guys that you don't want to lose, but it's 50-50, right? And at the end of the day, one guy's going to win. Um, Dan Hooker was tough because Dan Hooker obviously lost Arnold Allen. That's no secret. Um, and after the fight, you know, we saw him take a seat on the stool. We saw him lay his head down. And he must be feeling like, you know, I'm a guy who works my ass off. I'm a guy who is one of the most talented guys in the world. And I know I'm one of the most talented guys in the world. And I'm a guy who... Like, shit, I want it, man. I want it. And I'm not putting, and I'm putting the fucking effort. And I, you know, like, I love this game. And it's not giving back to me the way I am giving back to the game, right? And I, I, I genuinely feel for guys like that because Dan Hooker is a guy that maybe this doesn't make sense, but he's lost all these fights. But he's a guy who, if he, who also deserves to have won all these fights. He's a guy who you wouldn't be shocked if he won all of these fights that he have won because he's on that level. The problem is he's someone that's fighting the absolute best in the world. You know, like let's, I want to do this guy credit, man, because this isn't some, this isn't, I'm not going to put Dan Hooker down. We're not about to do that. We're going to fucking uplift this guy because this guy is fights everybody. Like, you guys get that? He's not a guy who's a bum on a five-fight losing streak. Or he's a guy who's, like, number 10 to 15 in the lightweight division. And he's losing to, like, no offense, I love these guys. But there's levels to this shit. The Bobby Greens, Diego Ferreras, you know, all these guys. He's not losing to those guys, man. He's losing to the best in the world. He took the Islam fight on short notice, guys. Lost to Islam. Are you going to blame him for that? He lost, look, he beat... Hawk Prost, his last fight before the, not the last fight, the one before the Islam fight, got a W, got a, you know, got a win back under his belt. He fought Michael Chandler. He lost to Chandler, okay. Chandler's one of the best in the world. Lost to Poirier. Poirier is one of the best in the world, guys. He beat Paul Felder. He beat Ally Quinta. He beat Michael Vick. Or James Vick, rather. Beat Barboza. Come on, guys. Because the reason I say come on, guys, is that I've seen fucking slander on this man on Instagram. Oh, hot take. Dan Hooker's overrated. Where's Dan Hooker go from here? Does he stay at 145? Does he stay at 155? I don't know if he has a place in any division. Not true. He's facing the best guys in the division. He's like RDA, man. RDA was in a time, you know, there was a stretch where RDA was losing some fights that maybe he wasn't supposed to lose. Or RDA was losing... More fights than maybe he would have wanted. But guess what? When you go back and look at all those fights RDA lost, he was fighting the best of the best. And anytime he fights anything less than that, he wins. Dan Hooker is the same guy. Don't fall Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker, he's a dog, man. And you and there's something you got there's there's something to a guy accepting fights on short notice. There's something to a guy saying anytime, any place. He's like the new Donald Cerrone, man. He's a listen, Dan Hooker, bad guy. Bad man. We got to put some respect on Dan Hooker's name. Now we get to Arnold Allen. Where does Ar Arnold Allen go from here? You know, Arnold Allen's a guy who, again, no because I say again because we talked about it similar to Patty, but this dude's like on crack with that shit. No matter where the fight goes, Arnold Allen's going to have a, you know, he's going to thrive. If the fight goes on the ground, this guy is nasty in the submission department. Can get you in a submission standing even. So forget about the ground. You want to talk about submission department anywhere in the clinch standing on the ground. Arnold Allen's your guy for that. In the stand-up, the guy's got power. And here's something that I said, you know. Um, 
I said go. I the one thing, the main thing that I said leading into the Arnold Allen versus um, Dan Hooker fight was this is gonna be a fight. It's not gonna be two guys tentative. Oh, they're feeling each other out. Leg kick here and there. Circle the octagon. Jab, jab. Circle the octagon. These guys are gonna fight. They're gonna go up. Face to face, they're going to fucking punch each other in the face, punch each other in the face, leg kick. It's going to be a physical fight from the start. It's going to be an embodiment of what mixed martial arts is from the start with those two guys. And I said that. When I said that, I also, I believe I reiterated in the, one of the last episodes, I don't mean it's going to be a Gaethje versus Chandler kind of fight, guys. I mean, but it's going to be a fight. You know, if you're what this is what I mean. There's bad fights and there's good fights, right? There's fights that are shit, that are a bad representation of what you want to see in the sport. And there's a, there's fights that are, holy shit, what a dog fight. These girls are going at it. These guys are going at it. But then there's that middle ground where it's okay. If you're watching a fight with a friend and you're trying to put him on to mixed martial arts and that fight's on, you're okay with it. It's not doing you bad. Whereas like one of those fights where guys are tentative, that's doing you a disservice to what you're trying to show your friend, right? This fight did wasn't the most incredible fight ever, like right from the start to finish, but there was action. I knew there was going to be action in this fight. That's all I could really say about it. I knew that these guys were going to fucking go at it. They were going to go for it. There was going to be nothing of tentative, patience, timidness. No. That wasn't going to happen in this fight. So where does that put um, Arnold Allen? He's number seven right now in the division, right? Again, today is Tuesday. It's the matchmaker meeting. You know, again, I just said that could be a good thing, but could it also be a fucking bad thing? Maybe it takes him like to like Wednesday to update the fucking thing. I don't know. But... Arnold Allen is still number seven in the division. Um, I would think a win like this would at least put him over like Josh Emmett just because of like the activity, just for activity's sake, if you will, you know, just because he's been a bit more active lately. But again, it didn't do him bad. This was a win for him, man. Arnold Allen's a problem in that division. You know, he can take the, again, he can take this fight anywhere. Wherever this fight's got to go, he could take it. So he's a fight that I anticipate a lot of people don't want, man. You know? Look. Last episode, we ran through the whole division, right? And I said that Bryce Mitchell and Arnold Allen are in a very unique position. Because here's why. Max and Volkanovski, we got to believe that's going to be next after after uh, Korean Zombie versus Volkanovski. Just because it, it's, it's what has to be fucking done. Right? So... That you got to believe that's going to happen next. Eventually, it's going to eliminate both guys. So that means Arnold Allen, yeah, he's going to have to take another fight or two before he fights for the title. But he was like ranked number seven. What do you expect? But again, that'll take Max out of the equation or Volk eventually. There will be a clear-cut 145 king. Brian Ortega lost, lost, the, lost for the title twice. Fought for the belt twice, lost twice. Yair Rodriguez just lost to Max. Proved he's, you know, he's not there. He's not with those guys. Korean Zombie, again, we're about to find out. Again, I believe he's going to lose to Volkanovski. This is a crazy sport. We don't know what's going to happen. Korean Zombie could, could definitely win the fight, but I don't I don't think so. I'm almost not even interested in this Korean Zombie versus Volkanovski fight. It's weird, man, just because I think Volk's just going to walk through him. I don't think it's going to be a big problem for him. You know, like, I know MMA math doesn't work, but look what Brian Ortega did to him, right? Then look what Volk did to Brian Ortega. Look what Max did to Brian Ortega. There's levels to this shit. Calvin Cater. Calvin's a beast, but again, Max almost showed that there's levels to this. Like, you're not on my level, Calvin. So even if Calvin gets a couple more wins, until I see Max, he go back and avenge a Max Holloway loss, man. I don't see where Calvin gets to the level of a Volkanovski, of a Max Holloway, and maybe even of a Brian Ortega. Wouldn't that be a fun fight to make next? Brian Ortega versus uh, Calvin Cater. Josh Emmett. A guy who's had a couple setbacks, at least in the division, you know, whether it's been losses to Jeremy Stevens and things like that. So then we have Arnold Allen sitting there, fresh blood in the division, hasn't had really many setbacks on an eight fight win streak, guys. If you're on an eight fight win streak in the UFC, similar to the Islam Makachev argument, where Islam's on like what, like a 10 fight win streak, I don't give a fuck if it's mop buckets in the UFC. Okay? I don't care. I don't care. He's on an eight 
fight fucking win streak in the UFC. That means something. The UFC matches up the best against the best. When they say, kid, you've won four in a row. Okay, it's due time. Fight someone that's elite as hell. This guy's beat eight people in a row. He's one or two fights away from a title shot. You know? So again, by default, he's in that mix. And what I meant to say by tracing back to the last few episodes is I said, if Arnold Allen could beat Dan Hooker at UFC London, him and Bryce Smith are two dark horses in the division where they're fresh meat, they haven't had the setbacks that all the other guys have had, and there's someone that they're exciting. They're exciting to watch. Arnold Allen and Bryce Mitchell are going to be in the top five soon. They're going to be the new age of contenders at featherweight for the UFC. Book it. Tom Aspinall versus Alexander Volkov. Again, guys, you go back, you watch a previous episode where we talked about Tom Aspinall. I said, Tom Aspinall is a dark horse of the heavyweight division in the sense that if he beats Alexander Volkov, he's already in the top five or six in the heavyweight division. And Dana said that he's going to break into the top five if he were to beat Alexander Volkov, which, of course, he did this past weekend. Because Derek Lewis is five right now, but Derek Lewis has had enough setbacks where even though Volkov is six, Derek Lewis is five. If Tom Aspinall could beat Alexander Volkov, Derek, he, he deserves to leapfrog Derek Lewis, even though he just beat Volkov out of the two that are five and six. Now, Tom Aspinall, again, guys, new age of heavyweight. How many times do I have to reiterate this shit? New age of heavyweight. Him and Cyril Gaon are going to fight eventually because they're just better than everyone else. This is like the new breed. What does he do when he opens up the fight? This guy fights like, like heavyweights don't fight. This guy is... He's in him and Cyril Gaon, again, not just a new age, but almost an anomaly in the heavyweight division. The guy opens up the fights, again, immediate sw uh, uh, switching of stances. Leg kick, leg kick, pops him with the jab, switches stance again. This guy fights like a welterweight, like a middleweight. He's not fighting like a big boy which, who's just looking to put you out with his power. You know, like, he is a very well-rounded fighter. What does he do? He hurts Volkov standing up, gets the fight on the ground, finishes the guy in a fucking, uh, in a, what was it, a Kimura? Yeah, in a Kimura. You got to love guys like that in mixed martial arts where no matter where the fight goes, they're fucking dangerous, man. Got him on the ground, finished him. On the feet, hurt him multiple times. Tom Aspinall's a real deal, you know? Again, I don't know if this is updated. Okay, I can tell you right now, it's definitely not updated yet because Tom Aspinall still 11 and, Vol and uh, Volkov 6. So I guess that applies to every other fucking question. Every other time I brought up that question throughout the podcast, there you go. This is not updated yet, which it should be because it's Tuesday, but whatever. What the fuck, UFC? Tom Aspinall is about to crack into the top five. I mean, he beats Derek Lewis. He beats... I say he beats Curtis Blades because maybe he doesn't have the clear-cut advantage on the ground, but he can hold his old on the ground because he's a damn good wrestler, a damn good jiu-jitsu practitioner. But Alexander, Vol but uh, again, Tom Aspinall against Derek, against Derek Lewis, I, I take him. Against Curtis Blades, I take him. Against Tuivasa, who again, is sort of a one-dimensional fighter. You know, you know he's a guy who's going to look to knock you out. I take him against him. Against Stipe, you might even take him against Stipe, man. That's a... Again, that'd be a great fucking fight, him against Stipe. Um, you know, he called out Tuivasa, so that's what we have to assume could be next. I think he beats Tuivasa. And then that leads us to just the number one ranked guy besides the champion and Cyril Gaon. Him and Cyril Gaon is going to happen eventually. Whether they have to clean out all the other contenders and say, all right, this fight is going to be for the title shot. I'm predicting that Tom Aspinall versus Cyril Gaon will be the next number one contender fight for the heavyweight title to face Francis Ngannou. If John Jones doesn't come back, because that's a big if, you know, we know how talented John is. But again, man, back, it, nothing to do with John in this fight. Again, man, Tom Aspinall, what a stud. What a stud. You know, the new breed of heavyweight, a guy who got a big pop from the crowd when he won that fight. So you look at him and you say, hey, do we have a star in our hands? You know, it's interesting. It's been a great weekend of fights. Again, to reiterate, I feel like I say that a lot again. You know, again, again, again. But again, I repeat shit a lot. So I, you know, got to give shit context. UFC London, maybe the greatest UFC fight night ever. Like, I got to agree with the boss on that one. Maybe the greatest UFC fight night ever. You know, was it the most stacked card? You could put it up there. And then did the fights deliver on the level of finishes, excitement? 
you could put it up there. So both things might be the UFC, might be the greatest UFC uh, fight night ever, guys.